بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أما بعد uh, to begin in شاء الله as you all as the Aris Aris will advertise that the law of inheritance in a comparative perspective that is the Islamic law and the religious law so before we start I I would just like to uh, say all if you all have any questions or any queries or regarding any doubts regarding the slides or any of the points you can just ask in شاء الله and uh, regarding language inshallah i'll try my best to do in english uh, and i will do it in english but if you all want any clarification in tamil or something i can try my best inshallah uh, to give so so first inshallah before we start i would like to just to tell a background story as why this uh, event was organized in the first place and uh, what happened that for me to come out with this topic rather than any other topic so uh, as as you all might be aware i'm a law student Uh, I'm studying my second year in law, inshallah. By now, and I'll be going to moving to third year, inshallah, by next year. So, this law of inheritance is a law which is enacted in the Sri Lankan uh, legal system. So, as a law student, it is must that the teacher should that the teacher should teach us the law of inheritance in the Islamic perspective as well as the general perspective. So, one fine day when I was in class, and the teacher came to teach the law of inheritance. and she taught the general law it's very easy uh, it's written in one page in a one page document the general law re- with regards to succession and inheritance and then when she moved on to the islamic law of inheritance she gave me a tute she gave all the students a tute which was of two pages and what was mentioned there i was amazed that 90% of what was mentioned there is out of context uh, it was like they were they have said some different type of Uh, how to divide the inheritance and who inherits the order of inheritance everything was bit uh, not everything was wrong but most of them were wrong so then uh, since i knew as how to divide inheritance how the inheritance law works in islam i asked the teacher that uh, from where did you get this tute and she said this is the most prevalent tute which is there in law college so law college is the college which happens in supreme court and if anyone wants to practice it is important that they go to law college so uh, then i again asked her that uh, is it what they teach in law college also they said not exactly this but it is something similar to this but i have summarized from that book to this and i have given it to you then i said the teacher it is not like this uh, it is so and so how this how you divide and she said but i have not heard of this uh, type of division before then i said to the teacher if you want that since she already explained the class and the class was in full of doubt as to why uh, there is such division and why is it too much bias towards men why there is discrimination upon women i said to the teacher if she wills and if she can just to give me an hour or two and i will explain it to the class as how this really works and not as how the teacher uh, said and she gave me the opportunity alhamdulillah i was able to explain and the uh, class also was uh, i would say convinced that this is a more comprehensive legal system rather than the general legal system as followed in sri lanka so to begin with inshallah first i would be before going to the topic of inheritance uh, at the first place i would be uh, just going uh, a little facts into as how the legal system in sri lanka and how the islamic legal system differs so we have a uh, in uh, general legal system which is followed in sri lanka uh, not only inheritance all the other laws and the other legal system which is the religious legal systems i'm not meaning only islam so there is in when it comes to religious legal system there is the canon law legal system that is the from the bible which is derived from the bible and there is a legal system which is derived from the scriptures of the jews known as the halaka law and then there is sharia law which is derived from the islamic legal system so i would just briefly run through as to what these laws are and why these laws are needed and the main differences between all the laws so first uh, is what is law and why do we need them so if we ask many of the people they will have many uh, definitions for what is law and they will have many reasons why the laws are needed so uh, i also found one of the definitions and i just put it there for the sake of putting it but i will just explain as to why laws are needed so laws are set of regulations or rules which a governing body or of a state or a community has put 
in order to regulate the members of that community of the state. So for example, if we have the general law of Sri Lanka, it is to regulate the people of Sri Lanka. If we have an Islamic legal system, it is more importantly to regulate the Muslims who practice Islam rather than any other people. So uh, in other words, it can be said as rights and liabilities of individuals that are mentioned in, the, in those rules. So coming to as why we need laws, uh, this is, these are three principles which are mainly mentioned in law books, so I just put it there. So one is the harm principle. The harm principle is something like uh, we have laws, set of laws. Why? To protect people from harm. To protect people from harm. That's the first, uh, uh, first uh, need for law. And then the second one is morality principle. So the difference between harm and morality is morality is to protect the morals of a community of, or a culture. For example, I will take an example of zina. So why is zina pre uh, prevented in Islam? It is that the second principle which comes into play. This is to protect the morals of human. To protect the morals of human, zina is made haram. But why is, uh, for example, uh, interest made haram? It causes harm towards the economy of the country or economy of, the, of an individual. So that's what the is, uh, interest is made haram. And the third one is the status principle that is more of to protect a country or a state which is there. Uh, like from traitors and all those such laws. So this is the three major principles which are need for laws. That's, the, that's, the, that's just some theory uh, to be done and uh, those are the three theories. Yeah, so I said this laws are the govern, uh, the something which is used to govern or regulate the people of the country. So before studying any law or law of inheritance or be it a law of property or anything, there is three main things which I understand. So this is uh, repeated so many times, but why is it repeated? No one knows. So a government, maybe the Sri Lankan government or the Indian government or any government, they have three branches. One, they say it is known as the legislature, and one is the executive and the judiciary. So what does the legislature do? Their main role is to make laws. For example, we need a law to govern the law of inheritance. I'm taking this example for as it is used. So then what do we do? We put a bill in the parliament and then we enact it as a law. So that's the, since the parliament is the legislature of the Sri Lanka, so they enact laws, they make laws, they make new laws, whatever our requirements, they put them and they pass it as a law. So what does the executive do? The executive, what he does or what those group of people do is they implement those laws. They bring those laws into practice. They enforce those, those laws. For example, we, uh, maybe there is okay, uh, an example which is of used right now. We have the capital punishment, the death penalty. That law is brought into practice or brought into enactment by the legislature. In, 19, uh, sorry, in 1893, when the penal code was enacted, they bought that law of capital punishment of death penalty for who was always convicted. But until now, or of, pa of recent past, we cannot practice it. Why? Because the president doesn't sign it. Why? Because the executive only has the power to enforce those laws. Without the executive enforcing those laws, those laws, laws cannot be practiced even though it is there in the books of laws. So the death penalty was brought to legislation by this branch, but this branch has not allowed to practice it. So the third one, is the judiciary. This, uh, this branch of law, sorry, which, uh, this branch of the government is mainly to apply the laws, in, interpret the laws, and give uh, judgments. So we can, so for example, the, uh, we have a problem, whatever problem it is, maybe a criminal problem or a civil problem. So what we do, we go to the courts, this is normally the courts, we go to the courts, and we seek for judgment. What the judiciary do, the judges, they apply the laws, they interpret the laws, and then they give the judgments accordingly. So these three branches, normally in a government, or for a successful government, I would say, I would say these three branches will, will not lap each other. For example, they will have equal powers. They will have equal powers. So if I may to explain in a, in a better example, 
the executive, the head of executive is the president of the country. So what he does when he normally takes oath, he takes oath the, in front of the head of this, this, uh, this branch of the government. So he takes oath in front of the uh, chief justice of the country. So the chief justice is the uh, head of the judiciary. But that same chief justice will be appointed by the head of this branch. So there is no power over for him over him and there is no power for him over him also. The same applies here. The same applies to the first uh, branch also. So why I mentioned is this here is between the legal system of Islam and between the, I mean the religious legal system and between the contemporary religious system, there is a huge difference as to these branches. So we can see it in the next slide. Yeah. So the two main differences mentioned here, one is that in Islam we don't have uh, the, or in any religious system there is no anything called a legislature. Why? Because we have the Quran and Sunnah and that is the legislating power uh, of the religious legal system. For example, we have, we don't need a constitution. The Islamic legal system doesn't need a constitution. Why? Because it already has the Quran. It already has the Quran and it already has the Sunnah. So when we have new problems, what we should, what we do is, the, if there is an Islamic legal system, what they would do is, they would put it to the judge or the person responsible for the giving, to giving judgments and they would give, interpret those laws, the Quran and Sunnah accordingly and they would pass judgments. But in the contemporary legal system, since there is no laws, it is null, uh, it is zero, what they should do is, they should enact new laws and then bring it to enforcement. But the Islamic legal system is more comprehensive and it has been already uh, put forward in the Quran and Sunnah or if it's the uh, Christian, this thing is already put forward in Bible. Uh, so, so there is no need for a legislature. There is no need for legislature. That's what in the history when we go through we can see there is only uh, two people who normally are uh, as government servants. One is a, a wali or a khalifa or the leader. And then there is a qadi who is the justice, who is the judge. So in any city we can see in the uh, past that there was a qadi and there was a wali. There was a governor and there was a judge. So that is the one is the executive and the judiciary. There is no legislature in the Islamic legal system. Okay, so the second difference is this is a bit uh, of a nice difference uh, because now we have laws in Sri Lanka. These laws are shaped up by the economic and the social or political requirements. So if we have a different political requirement today rather than yesterday, they would change the law as, to the as it suits to the requirement of today. But in the Islamic legal system or any legal system, the requirements of the political and the economic or social uh, requirements should be shaped up by the law. That means we have a set of law and all those requirements should come under those laws. It can't lap the law. But in the, in the contemporary legal system, if we have the requirements, it can exceed the law and it can change the law. But in the Islamic legal system, we can't change the law, but we should change the requirements and how we attain those requirements. Those are the two main differences between the two legal systems. Okay. So from that, from that systems is uh, of the legal system or any legal system, there is a, a management system called wealth management system in Islam and it is where the law of inheritance comes in it. So law of inheritance is a subject which uh, falls in the major subject of uh, management of wealth. So when we say management of wealth, we have two kinds of management. One is when the individual is alive and after his death. So law of inheritance normally comes under the second category where the um, wealth is managed after the individual's demise. So that's what the last point says. Okay, normally when we go for janaza salas, we hear that the, the obligations upon a, upon a death is four. Normally before the salah he says that uh, before the uh, burial or prayers, they say that the obligations upon the death, dead is four. One is should, should bath him, they say ghusul, shrouding kafan, 
and then Salah and then uh, Burial. So, but if we analyze deeper, there is seven such uh, obligations. One is after his burial, his death should be settled. His debts should be settled. And then after settling his death, there is something called last will if he has done so. Last will is known as wasiya in more, uh, in more used terms. And then at last his inheritance, his wealth will be separated accordingly. Okay, debts. Uh, most, of our, most of us have debts, okay. So normally when a person is died, after he has died, they announce in the masjid that if he has to give someone, you all can contact the son or the, any relative and they shall, pay, they shall pay off their debts. But it is to be understood that there is two types of debts. Two types of debts. One is what the janaza has to pay. One is what the janaza has to pay. So if you go and ask the relatives, this is what they announce. If they go and ask the relatives, they will pay off their debts and they will, uh, it will be gone. But this part is very less talked about and very uh, seldomly often ignored uh, regarding the assets, that means the receivables. What the janaza should receive. So for example, if Zaid has died, if Zaid has died, and there is someone called, uh, okay, I could say Akil or someone who should give him some wealth. But that part is often ignored and this person also doesn't contact, contact the, the, uh, the family of the dead. But, and he goes off with that death. But the first death, this one, if the person who is to receive, if he thinks, okay, this person is dead, his family is in trouble, why would I go and add the trouble to him and I would forgive him, then it is okay, then it is valid. But if this person thinks that that person has already forgiven, then it is not valid. Why? Because that wealth which, is, which he is supposed to give is not the wealth of the dead anymore. It is not the wealth of the demised anymore. It is the wealth of the inheritors. It is the wealth of the inheritors and not the dead anymore. Since after his death, even though it is not separated, it is in the right of the inheritors and not in under his uh, liability. Okay. Okay, the last will. As you all know, Wasiya, uh, it is often encouraged us to do a last will, encouraged for us to do a last will in the Juma sermons, all the sermons they say that we should do a last will to leave a legacy and to leave a mark as to why we left, uh, lived here and what type of leg, uh, last will we can give, Sadaqah, Sadaqatul Jariya, all those are taught. But uh, uh, there is two things which should be taken into consideration when giving last will. One is that uh, when giving last will, the amount which should, can be given is only 33%. 33% that is one third of his wealth. Only one, under one third of his wealth he can write a last will and if he exceeds that, then that last will shall not be fulfilled more than that. For example, if he writes for 40%, if he writes 40% of my wealth goes to this masjid, then that 40% shall not be fulfilled but rather a 33% of that shall be fulfilled. But if the inheritors will so, they wish, okay, the janaza like to give 40%, then it's not a problem. And the other one is anyone who is inheriting from his wealth subsequently after his death, for, him, for them also the inheritance cannot be written and if, he, if it is written, that inheritance is not valid and is void. Okay, why are these two uh, conditions mentioned? So the main moral behind such two conditions being written is one is to leave the inheritors after the after the demise of that individual, that means his children or any of the successors, financially stable so that they can carry on their lives. For example, if a father passes away and he leaves his son who is not yet uh, capable of earning a living, then to leave them financially stable without begging, that is the rationale behind, the, behind why the first condition is put. As for the second condition, so why this is put into rule is that because to leave the inheritors, the children or the, any successors 
after one's demise, financially stable so that they will be able to carry on their life as normal even though after his demise, his or her demise. Why this? The second condition is put is that why the inheritors will not inherit from one's wealth is because to support and encourage social stability and welfare. So for example, it is not, it is, people should understand that it is not only his family and his successes that he should consider uh, in, under his wealth, but rather the social welfare also should be considered and to in, in order to promote that, that is why it is said that the inheritors cannot inherit. So 33% and the inheritors cannot inherit, that's the two. Yeah, sure. Yeah. What does the Quran say about the will? Does it say that you have to stay in your present state? No, uh, this, the, actually the, <coughs> uh, the juristic writings say that it is 33% from the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where one Sahabi, he comes and asks, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he comes and asks, can I donate all of my wealth? No. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says no. Then he asks two third. He still says no. And then he asks one third and he, then he, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allows him and he says that astulusu vastulusu kathir. You can give one third, but even one third is more. You can give one third, but even one third is more. And then he says that you leaving your family or successors wealthy enough and financially stable is better than leaving them uh, begging from people. So that is why the the jurists, the ulama, the fuqaha, they have written that it is 33% taking deriving from that hadith. Okay. Okay. Now the subject of inheritance. Before this, I would just like to uh, go backwards a little, and I would explain one thing, uh, which yeah, which I I have written it, but I missed it. Okay. The difference between legal, the religious legal system, and the contrary legal system. So I mean, uh, I said there is no legislature in the Islamic legal system, and then I said that all the requirements are shaped according to the law. And in the contemporary legal system, the law is shaped according to the requirements. So, one, uh, one of the contemporary jurists of Islam, Mufti Taqi Usmani, who is very famous in the law field in the, in, for his juristic writings and stuff. So, he says that the contemporary law is enacted by people, even though all the parliamentarians are people. So, he says they are enacted by people. And when they enact such laws, there is a major conflict of interest. What is that conflict of interest is that they are also people and they are creating laws for people. So he mentions a nice example regarding that. He says that what will happen if the principals of the, if the management of a school call the senior class, I mean the, maybe the year 12 or the year class and says, okay, you create the laws for your school. You create the rules and regulations for their school. And he asked, will there will be any justice in that rules and regulation? Why? First thing they will do, they will exclude their self from any problems. When there is a, when the year 12 does the rules and regulations of a school, they will exclude their self from getting any problems. For example, we have a madrasa here and we tell the sixth year boys, okay, come, uh, uh, write the rules and regulations of your madrasa. First thing they will do, since they want to come late, they will say, okay, Moza starts at 9 o'clock. That's what they will, that, that, because they will exclude their self from any type of liability. So that's what it's happening in any, in the contemporary legal system. He says, Mufti Taqi Usmai says, these are such laws which are created by man, for man, who are created from sand and uh, flesh. So these people are trying to create laws for people which is a major conflict of interest. So that's what, uh, that's why I want to come behind and explain the, this legal system, what's the difference between the two legal systems. Okay, inheritance. So this is the last obligation which should be, uh, which should be done for the uh, deceased. So, okay, one important thing that needs to be mentioned is, for example, if the father has given the child something before the, uh, before his demise, then that thing will not be taken into account when separating the, when distributing the inheritance, the wealth. For example, the father has given, because since it happens 
It's the custom of our country that the father gives the child uh, the house or something. And then upon his demise, the brothers, they exclude the sister from giving the inheritance. And they say that the father has already given them the house. So you cannot ask inheritance. So in this case, the, the daughter shall get the right to inherit from the father. And anything given as gift or any customary obligation when she's getting married or something, that shall not be taken into account when, uh, when distributing the wealth. OK. Yeah. The third point is uh, in Sri Lanka, we can practice the, legally, we can practice the Islamic law of inheritance through this act, Muslim Interstate Succession Ordinance, 1931. It's been in 1931, our forefathers have already enacted this law and given us the uh, opportunity to legally practice the Muslim uh, in law of Islamic law of inheritance. And as for general law, that means those who are non-Muslims who practice, they practice under the Matrimonial Rights and Inheritance Ordinance. Uh, that is not a elaborative or comprehensive way of separating that inshallah after the Islamic law of inheritance, we'll just run through it inshallah. Okay. Islamic law of inheritance. So in the, in the Islamic legal system, there is so many laws. But this is a very unique law. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this set of laws everything in the Quran itself. And he has left very little to be explained by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about prayers, he says, uh, pray, aqimus salah, pray. So the time he says, he has mentioned, the Quran mentions uh, sometimes, but it is elaborated by Nabi Sallallahu It is explained by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi as when to pray and how to pray. So Jibreel Islam comes and shows us how to pray and the times of praying. But the laws of inheritance are not such. The laws of inheritance in Surah Tun Nisa, uh, chapter, verse number 11 and 12, in, in a one page, over two verses, Allah SWT comprehensively says who gets how much and who inherits, who does not inherit. Everything is mentioned. And one more verse, the last verse of Surah Tun Nisa, also uh, is in, with regard to inheritance. So this law, the law of inheritance in Quran, unlike any other law, is comprehensively mentioned, completely mentioned. Completely means 90% of the law is mentioned in the Quran and it, it is very least which is left for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to explain as to what the, uh, does that mean. For example, if we take zakah, uh, it is mentioned that the zakah of a goat is mentioned in the Quran. But the others, how you give zakah, it is mentioned in the hadith. So those are, uh, for example, if you take salah and zakah, all those, you have to take from hadith and you have to take from the uh, Quran also. But inheritance, most of them, 90% of the uh, rules and regulations are covered up in the Quran and it is comprehensively stated with the number one sixth, one eighth, half. Everything is completely stated that uh, this is how much you should give for whom. The brother inherits so much, the father inherits so much, the mother inherits so much. Everything is completely stated in the Quran itself, in those two verses, in this 11 and 12th verse. Inshallah, if you all get the opportunity, you all can read the translation or any comprehensive translation which mentions Mufti Taqi's translation would be better. He uh, mentions it nicely and comprehensively enough. Okay. So there are some ahadis also which provides in, insights as to how the Islamic law of inheritance should work, how it should be distributed also. Okay. Now come to the distribution. When we come to the distribution, there is four things which should be considered. The conditions for inheritance. The conditions for inheritance should be considered first. And then if there is any limitations and those limitations should be considered and then we should consider that if the person who is going to inherit, whether he falls under one of these categories, whether he is deprived or hindered from inheriting. So these are two types. We'll uh, later on go into the details of what is deprived and hindered and the hierarchy of distribution. Should fall on the correct hierarchy of distribution and then uh, he uh, inherits. Okay. So we saw the conditions of inheriting, the conditions. So first one, the conditions of inheriting is here. Okay, there is three conditions. There is three conditions. One is the person should be dead. 
the owner of the well should be dead. For example, if someone is going to inherit this phone, then the owner of this phone should be dead. So that's the first uh, condition of inheritance. And the second one is the one who is going to inherit. For example, someone wants to inherit this phone. The son of the owner of this phone wants to inherit. That son should be alive when the owner is dying. So the owner should die and the one who is inheriting should be alive when he is dying. And the third one, he should have the knowledge how he is going to inherit. For example, the son is going to inherit from his father. So he should know that he is going to inherit from, his, from such person because I am his son. By way of that I am his descendants, I am getting the inheritance. So that should be known. Okay, there is one thing that should need to be mentioned in this. For example, a person dies. We bury him. So we know that he is dead. We know that he is dead. So what happens to a person who is gone missing for a long time? So we had that problem in the LTT times, the war, civil war times. We had that so many people went missing. What do we do to their wealth? Is it seized or it's the government property? What do we do is, there is a prescribed amount the Fukaha, the jurist mentioned, that is if, if, if he is lost for a period of time, then the ulama can give a, a fatwa or a verdict or a ruling in the Islam, in the court, that this person is dead legally. Legally he is dead and even now in Sri Lanka it's seven years. As to the general law, if he's gone missing seven years, they can go to the court and they can say that uh, this person is being missing for seven years. So they will issue a legal document saying that he is legally dead. And that document can be used for the distribution of wealth and such. So in, in the Shafi Mazhab, it's, I think it's most probably four years. And some of the Mazhab, they have mentioned 120 years also. And even in the Sri Lankan legal system, in the past days, it was about 80, 90 years. And then later it was amended and it was brought to seven years for the practicality of it. Okay. Limitations. So limitations are generally what will bar a person from inheriting, for example. Uh, the, fa the son is there and he wants to inherit from his father. <coughs> then there are some limitations. He will not inherit from his father. So first one is not relevant to these days, but since it's, it's, a, it's a limitation to be mentioned, I'll be mentioning slavery. So for example, if one person is a slave in those times, then the slave will not inherit from any of his relations. Because even though if he inherits, that wealth shall go to his master. Because everything what the slave owns, it was the custom of that time, everything what the slave owns goes to his father. It's not relevant in these times, but still it is mentioned uh, it needs to be mentioned because it's one of the limitations. And murder. The second one is murder. So, okay. In murder, for example, there is father and son. The son murders the father. Then, in simple example, the son will not inherit from the father. Why this is made, uh, why this is prevented is, if this has been allowed, there will be a lot of people who kill the, in his, the person whom he, whom he is going to inherit from because of the wealth. So, and in these days, and in these days, since the love for wealth has increased, this will be more prevalent in these days. So that's what the, uh, the Quran says, that the, uh, sorry, the Fuqaha say, if the inheritor kills from whom he is going to inherit, then he shall not inherit. And they mention a famous, uh, what do you say, famous rule, they say, uh, So what is that means is, whosoever hurries to do one thing before its time, then he will be punished by him being hindered from getting it, by him not getting it. For example, that's the same example, a person, uh, son kills his father, so he hurries to get the father's wealth before the exact time comes then the punishment for him is he will not get that wealth. And the third one is difference of religion. So uh, it's, it's normal, so the, if a Muslim is there and he dies and he has a son who is, non, who is not a Muslim, then that son will not inherit and vice versa also. If the father is a non-Muslim and the son is a Muslim, the, mus the Muslim son will not inherit from the father also. Okay, one thing 
this needs to be, I mentioned this uh, topic, uh, this, this point because uh, when I was in class and I, I said this to the, uh, my colleagues, they asked me why, why are they confining the uh, inheritance towards the Muslims only. So since they were non-Muslim, then I had to add this because and I said to them, if he really wants to give, there is a way to give. If he really wants to give uh, to a non-Muslim, his son or anyone, there is a way to give. What can he do? He can write a last will that since he knows that he's a non-Muslim and he's not going to get, there's a last, he can write a last will and say that uh, this person is a non-Muslim, but still he can give the last will. So I had to add this and I told them that, and I stated them, even in the Candian law, which is practiced legally in Sri Lanka, even in that, it will not go out of the family. You can't write last will. You can only give to the family. Even in the Jaffna law, known as Tesavalamai law, even in that, they uh, are very much, uh, very much strict on that, that the wealth will not go out of the family. So one famous story you all might know is that one wife is shared by so many brothers. So the rationale behind that practice is they don't want the wealth of the family going out of the family. So they are very much strict on property. So that's what those kind of customary practices were uh, practiced. So I was, I stated that and then I said that it is not like the other laws, but you can write a last will even if you want to give. So there, those are the limitations. Okay, then I said the third thing that should be considered is whether he's deprived or hindered. So both of them, uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between both of them. Deprivation and uh, hindrance, okay. Can we include the adopted children in that list? In the uh, last will. The limitation to uh, adopted children, actually they don't come. They don't inherit, can they? They can't inherit, but they don't uh, come under the limitations. But you can say that they also can be given a last will since they are in, not inheriting. Last will can be written to anyone except the, uh, except those two conditions. So last will, so if they are not under this, they, anyone can be given inheritance, uh, sorry, last will. So if they are not an inheritor, since the uh, adopted child is not an inheritor, they can be given this. Children uh, born out of wedlock. Born out of? Uh, same, adopt, same ruling of illegitimate child, same ruling of uh, adopted child. But uh, I think uh, the, the Sri Lankan legal system, you can inherit from the mother. No. The, not from the father, you can inherit from the mother. <laughs> and uh, even in the Islamic uh, law of inheritance, the Hanafi Mazhab has said that uh, one can inherit from his mother. The illegitimate child can inherit from his mother. Okay, uh, deprivation means because of, a, because of a limitation, that means either he has killed someone or because he's not a Muslim or he, the one who has died is not a Muslim, then he will be deprived from inheriting from that person. So deprivation is that. And hindrance is, for example, there's a grandson. So there's three generations, father, son, and grandson. So a hindrance is, now if the son is not there, the grandson will get. So when the son is there, he is a hindrance for the grandson to get the inheritance. So that is known as hindrance. So in another example, there is grandfather, father and son. The son has died. Due to the existence of the father, the grandfather is hindered from uh, getting inheritance. Hope you understand. Okay, that is hindrance and deprivation because these words will be used uh, frequently in the following uh, slides. That's why I would like to mention this. And uh, I'll mention it again. Deprivation is because of uh, limitation which has occurred. They're like he has killed the father or he has killed the one from whom he's going to inherit. Or he's from a different religion from the inheritor then he will be deprived from inheriting. And as for hindrance, if there is someone who is, should be given more preference above him, then he will be hindered from in inheriting. For example, from the father's wealth, the son should be more preferred to inherit than the grandson. So 
since the son is there, the grandson will be hindered or barred from inheriting. Okay, the main thing, the hierarchy of the hierarchy of distribution. So the hierarchy of distribution means like when the wealth is there, now after the last will is given, the debt is given, after everything is given, when you come to the uh, when you come to the distribution level, we have the hierarchy of distribution. Uh, if the if the people who are going to inherit are okay to inherit, then we come under this hierarchy. So the first one is quota based inheritors. So these quota based inheritors, they are Meant their amount which they are going to inherit is clearly stated in the Quran. Like if it's half, it's half. If it's one eighth, it's one eight. It's one sixth, one sixth. It's clearly mentioned, and the people are mentioned. For example, the mother gets one third when the mother gets one sixth in these places. So that is clearly mentioned. So first, their quota will be given. The quota which is mentioned for them will be given. If it's one sixth, the one sixth will be given. If it's one third, the one third will be given. And then they will move to the next category. Next category is residual inheritors. In Arabic, they call asaba. I think all are more uh, the word asaba is more relevant than the residual inheritors. So these inherit, what they will do is after the mentioned portion is given to the first category, these people they will take the balance of the whatever is balanced, they will uh, distribute it among them and take it. For example, if the mother gets one third of the wealth and the remaining two third will be distributed among the uh, residual inheritors uh, according to the ratio of the man gets one, the man gets two and the female gets one. That means, for example, if a male gets two portions, the female will get one portion. So the, generally, the, man, the male will get double the amount of the women. So if this, if not any of the Asaba people, the residual inheritors are not present, then what they will do, they will go to the third category. What's the third category? Back to the first category, they will again, according to the quote I mentioned, they will again distribute that wealth here. But when they are distributing to the third time, they will not include the spouse in it. The spouse will not come for the second time. For example, mother is there. The, cha the spouse is there, but there is no, uh, there is no, the wife is there, the mother is there, and there is no children. So the wife will get 25%, the mother will get um, one third, and then the balance should go here, but since there is no any residual inheritors, then again it will go there, and from the balance, the mother will get one third, and the wife will not get anything. Hope I understand. Okay, then the fourth one is, the relatives who are not from these two types, these are very rare. Those who are not from these two types, the relatives, they will get um, the, if, if this also is not available, sorry, if after this also there is balance, the relatives will get a portion. And then even after that, if, the, if it doesn't go, this is very rare, it will go back to the spouse. And even if after that, if it didn't finish, the master, for example, he has been a slave one day, and after he was freed, he has come to this state. So the master who freed him will get the amount. And if not, the last will be, will be given. And even if there is no last will, it will go to the Baitul Mal, the treasury. So this is the general hierarchy. So it's normally until this. It's normally these first two categories in uh, practice, which uh, the uh, wealth is already distributed and done when it comes to the, this category. And it doesn't go below this generally. It only under exceptional circumstances, it goes below the second one. Okay. These 17 are the people who will generally inherit, not generally, always they will inherit. That means uh, the people who come under inheritance are these seven people, sorry, these 17 people. Male has 10 and the female has uh, seven. So first one is the, in the male, the son, the son of the deceased. And then there is grandsons and the descendants. That means the grandson and below. And then the father, grandfather and above, then brother. All means it can be a brother, a full brother, or a half brother from the mother or from the father also. So nephew means it can be a nephew from a full brother. That means a nephew means brother's child. 
a brother's son, so it can be either a full brother's son or a brother from a father, his son. Same as to uncle also, full and pa uh, paternal, either father's brother, uh, either uh, uncle from whose, whose father and mother is the same as his father's and mother, the janaza's father's and mother, or paternal, only father is the same. And then cousin, that is the uncle's son, the same rule applies here, the husband and the master if any. So the same applies to here also, daughter and then mother, the father, but the granddaughter doesn't come. <coughs> So, granddaughter doesn't come from the mother's side, the granddaughter comes from the father's side. The son's daughter. The son's daughter inherits uh, under some circumstances and her and the descendants. And then the grandmother, means grandmother, it can be either mother's mother or father's mother also. And then sister, sister is also all like the brother, whether from the mother or from the father or a full brother, sister. And then wife and the uh, the master who is a woman. Is this clear? Yes, I'll just give time so I can go through it. I didn't get your uncle. Yeah, the deceased grandmother. No, if she's died, she doesn't get. So the conditions is that that the person who is going to inherit should be alive. If he's not alive, then she's uh, they are gone. So they are wiped out of inheritance. Only if they are alive, they get inheritance. Otherwise, they don't get. So if she, if one of these are dead and gone, then there is no point of talking. They don't generally inherit. Okay. Hindrance to inheritors. So I said that normally what's hindrance in the, in the above slide, I said to you all that hindrance is something because of the someone who is more preferred than such person, he is hindered from inheriting. For example, I give the example of son and grandson. Because the son is there, the grandson is made, uh, he's hindered from inheriting from the father's wealth. So when you come to hindrance, there's two types. One is complete hindrance and partial hindrance. So complete hindrance means the son is there, the grandson is there, the son, grandson doesn't get any of the wealth because the son is there. Because the existence of the son, the grandson doesn't get any of the wealth. He doesn't get even a small portion of the wealth. That is complete in, in hindrance. Partial hindrance means he is there. For example, mother. The mother, if no one is there, if no child or no father is there, he gets one third, she gets one third. But if they are there, if one of the child or someone is there, she gets one sixth. So it reduces her amount. In this, completely out of inheritance. But in this category, they are not completely out, but the amount which is given to them is reduced. More easy example, the wife. The wife, if the dead has no children, if the deceased has no children, she inherits 25%. But if the children are there, if there is an issue of the uh, deceased, if there is a child of a deceased, then she inherits 12.5%. That's one eighth. She inherits 12.5%. Because the son is there, she is, her amount is reduced and she is partially hindered from in inheriting. Okay. That is the two types of inheritance. Now, these six people, the son, daughter, father, mother, husband, and wife. Whatever circumstances they are, if these six people are there, they will however get the wealth. They will however, under any basis, they will attain the wealth. Sometimes it can be by residuary, that means by asaba, or sometimes by quota based, they will however, if these six people are there, the others will never get a wealth. These six people are the most important people. And these people are the most relevant. These daughter, father, mother, husband, wife. Okay, residual inheritors. That means Asaba. In this, so these people, they take the remaining of the wealth after 
the inheritance is distributed, the wealth is distributed to the first category. These people, they take the remaining of the wealth on the basis that two portions is given to the ma uh, man and one portion is given to the female. That means the man male inherits uh, double the amount of the female. So to come under this category, there is three types. One is by origin. Whatever circumstances he is, he is a uh, asaba, he is a residuary. The second one is if there is an another person, if there is another person in the scenario, then he comes and he becomes a residuary, he becomes an asaba. And the third one, residuary with another, there's a small difference between this and this. In this, the one who is there, for example, uh, the brother, if the brother is there, the sister becomes a residuary. If the son is there, the daughter becomes a residuary. So this is that. But in this, both of them inherit. But in this, the one who is there will not inherit. But the one who is a residuary will inherit. In this, both parties will inherit. In this, only one party will inherit. Further, inshallah, when we see in the next slide, inshallah, we can uh, go deeper. Okay. Residuaries by origin. That means, whatever circumstances they are, they are residuaries. They are people of Asaba. They will only take the balance of from the remaining. One is by descendants. Those are son, grandson, and below. By ascendance means father, grandfather, and above. By brotherhood means the deceased, his brothers. Not his sisters, only his brothers. But it should be full and paternal, not maternal. Not the brother from the mother. It is only brother from one father or brother from the same mother and father. So they will always be under the residuary type. And unclehood means the dead, his uncles, his father's brothers, they also will come under this category. But it is important that they are also either full or paternal and not maternal. So when it comes to residues by origin, if this category is there, then these three categories will go out. If this is not there, this will come and this will be out. If this is there, this will get and this won't get. So the last stage is this. So this is a hierarchy. So when this is there, this gets. So this there, this all three is gone. When this is not there, this follow gets. When this is also not there, this gets and like that, it's the hierarchy which goes uh, through. When a son is there, the father doesn't get. The father doesn't get from this type. But he, for him, he will get one six because a quota is mentioned. In the presence of a son, the father will get one six. At that time, the son will come under this category. The son will inherit from this. And then brotherhood, uh, the brothers of the deceased, the dead, and unclehood, the uncles of the deceased. Okay, then this is the second type of residuary, that's the asaba, the second type. By the existence of another person, uh, she becomes an inheritor by residual, uh, residual purpose. First one, okay, they, have, they become residuary in the existence of male counterparts. That means, for example, daughter, who, the male who is in her level is the son. So, if the son is there, the daughter becomes a residual inheritor. So for example, there is a daughter, but there is no son. Then she will inherit half of the wealth. But there is a daughter and there is a son. They will not, she will not inherit half of the wealth directly, but the wealth will be separated according to two, one. That means the male will get two and the female will get one and accordingly it will be given. But if the son is not there, a portion is mentioned for her in the Quran, that is half of the wealth, she will be given that. But if the son is there, she will be given that portion according to the ratio of 2, 1. The male gets 2, the female gets 1. So the same applies, son's daughter and son's son. Son's daughter and son's son is the, if the granddaughter is, if the grandson is there, the granddaughter comes under this category. So if a sister, if the brother is there, the sister comes under this category. If the paternal sister is there, the paternal brother comes, so if the paternal brother is there, the paternal sister also comes under this category. So this is also the same hierarchy. When they are there, they, 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 all three don't get. 
So it comes on the same hierarchy as the above. So this one uh, is a bit restricted. It, it rarely happens. This is there is sisters, but there is no sons and brothers. There is no sons and brothers, but there are daughters. For example, a person has one daughter, and he has sisters also. So the daughter will get half of the wealth, and sorry, he has a mother, a sister, and a daughter. So what the mother will get, since there is a descendants, she will get one third, one sixth of the wealth. Sorry, one eighth of the wealth. That is twelve point five percent, and the daughter will get half of the wealth. That is sixty two point five percent, and the rest, since there is no sons and the brothers, the sisters will come under this category. So, but this rarely happens. But this also is part of that, and the sister will take the balance wealth. Okay, now the the residuaries are the second category inheritors. But I should mention it in order to explain this. That's why I had mentioned it before in the before part. So these are the quota based inheritors. So quota based inheritors, their amount, what they inherit, is clearly mentioned in the Quran. So, so a specific quota is mentioned in the Quran. So in those two verses, it is mentioned one sixth. Uh, so yeah. So this number of quotas mentioned are six. There is six types of quotas which are mentioned. One is half of the wealth. That is fifty percent. One fourth of the wealth. That's twenty five percent. One eighth. That is twelve point five percent. Two third is sixty six percent. One third is thirty three percent. And one sixth is about. Uh, 16 percent. Yeah. So those are the six numbers which are mentioned in the Quran: half, one fourth, one eighth, two third, one third, and one sixth. So any amount which is mentioned, any quotas which is mentioned, it will be either one of these six uh, numbers. So in the next slide, I have put a table also yeah, for for the understanding. I'll explain that inshallah. Okay. Now here I mentioned. these four people these four people these four people if the male counterpart is not there if these people are not there the amount they will get is 2/3 those four people these four people if the male counterparts are not there the daughter son's daughter full sister paternal sister if their male counterparts are not there they will get 2/3 of the wealth and same thing the mother in the absence of any issue that means any children any descendants for the dead or siblings the dead has no siblings dead has no children then she will in inherit one third and if there is if there is a ch child or any brother or sister for the dead then she will inherit one sixth the father in this case will inherit one sixth if there is any sibling if there is any issue that means children and if there is no issue then he becomes a residuary as we saw before he comes he comes from this because there is no issue no there is no children so he gets from this place and he doesn't get from a quota based system so the table is mentioned here so who inherits half the husband the husband so the dead is the wife in this scenario the dead is the wife and has no children then he inherits half but if he has children she will inherit one fourth same from the wife if the dead is the deceased is the husband and he has no children then she will inherit one eighth sorry one fourth and if he has children he will she will inherit one eighth 25% and 12.5% if he has children she will if he has no children she will inherit 25% and if he has children She'll inherit twelve point five percent. So now these are the four people I said they will. If the male counterparts are not there, they will inherit half. These are the four. If she is there, she they three won't get. So it goes from the hierarchy. So if the son is not there, the daughter will get half. So if the daughter and the son is not there, the son's daughter will get half. So it goes like that. So what happens if there is two daughters and no sons? They will come under two third, sixty six percent. So the same four people are mentioned here also. If there is one, they will get half. 
if there is 2 they will get 2 third so that is clear so the mother I said if there is no siblings and no issue she will get one third but if there is siblings or any issue she will get one sixth so the father I said if there is any issue he will not get from the residual purpose but he will rather get one sixth so father one sixth but if there is, child, uh, there is no children he will take the remaining and he won't come under this table so if the father is not there the grandfather if the mother is not there the grandmother get one sixth so this is uh, okay this these two there is a daughter there is a daughter and there is a son's daughter also there is a daughter and there is a son's daughter what will they do what they will do is the daughter will take half the daughter will take half and the son's daughter will take one sixth the daughter will take half and the son's daughter will take one sixth and it becomes if you join those together it becomes two third it becomes two third there is one daughter and there is one uh, son's daughter then what happens is the daughter will take half and the son's daughter will take one sixth the same applies to these both also so in the presence of the daughter the son's daughter is not completely hindered but partially hindered from inheriting because her uh, amount will be reduced from half to one sixth so the daughter will get half and the son's daughter will get one sixth the so same applies the full sister and paternal sister and maternal brother is the deceased brother but uh, not full brother but has the same mother what happens is if there is two or more maternal brothers they get one third if there is only one they get one sixth but there should not be any full brothers or paternal brothers in order that she come under this I'll just leave this for some time so that yeah sure Okay. And uh, no parents. Yeah. Now, son says, if you die, I don't want your inheritance, give it to the daughter. So, in that case, can I give that only to the daughter because he has a house? If the son willfully says that he doesn't want, of the, want the inheritance, then there is no any problem. So, can I get it back? Right? Yeah, it's better that it is, get, it is taken in written form. Any contract, it is better that it is taken in written form rather than verbal. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, it is okay that you mention, but it is better that if you can get a consent from the son also, a sign from the son, or any type of consent from the son that saying that he doesn't want the wealth. Okay, this is the table, uh, half, one-fourth, one-eighth, two-third, uh, one-third, and one-sixth. So all the 17 people are there, and sorry, the, most of the people are there, and four people, the male, they come under residual, these things. Okay, now come to the general law of inheritance. So matrimonial rights and inheritance ordinance 1876. This is the law which governs the... Uh, general law of inheritance it's a 10 page document like this uh, it's very brief very brief there is not much to explain in it so what I have done is the summary of the uh, summary of the, the way of distribution is mentioned here so first thing which needs to be uh, taken is if one dies interstate only the wealth will be distributed that means if a person who is under the general law, who is governed by a general law, he dies and he says in his last will that all my wealth should be given to so and so after my death. All my wealth should be given to so and so after my wealth. In that case, 100% of his wealth will be given to the person whom he has written the wealth for. 100% of the wealth will be given to the person who he will be written for and it will not go to any of his descendants or ascendants whatsoever. For example, he has written for one of his friend. He has written for one of his friend. Then 
that wealth will be given to his friend and his sons, his parents, his brothers, siblings, everyone will be made, will be hindered and barred from uh, inheriting um, if he dies testate. But if he dies interstate, then this way is uh, taken in practice. So what's the way? First one, the surviving spouse, whether it's husband or the wife, they inherit half. 50% of wealth will be go given to the spouse, husband or wife. Then the children and the descendants. The next half will be given to the children. And if the children, if there is three children and one child is dead, the, uh, the deceased child, their children will represent the father and get the wealth 50%. So if the children are not there, both parents, they will take the share, they will take the 50% of the wealth. Spouse will get half, no children, the parents will get 50%. So if only one parent is there, that parent will take 25% and the other 25% will be uh, separate among the siblings. So 50 will be given to the spouse, 25 and 25. If both parents are not there, that 50%, the siblings will separate among them and take it. So if the spouse is not there, if he's not married, what ha happens is the parents will take 50 and the siblings will take 50. And uh, yeah, the siblings will take 50. If no siblings, the parents will take completely the wealth. So this is the general uh, way that they separate. So since I mentioned if one dies interstate, there is a famous case when they come to study this which they study is, there was a person who wrote all his wealth for his dog. He wrote all his wealth for his dog. In the name of his dog, he wrote that if I die, all my wealth should be given to the dog. So what happened was, it was a big case and it went until the Supreme Court. I, I think it's in Sri Lanka most probably or in one of the other countries. And finally, they come, came to the conclusion that it should be given to the dog and that shall be governed by the district court of that place the wealth, the management of the dog shall be governed by the district court of that place. And none of his children or his uh, spouse or the parents got any wealth from that money. It was written to the uh, dog. So uh, since one dies interstate came, I just mentioned that story here. So what happens if the dog dies? <laughs> It'll go to the treasury. The government will take it. Okay. This is a very important question. Why women are given less than men? Why are women given one person? Uh, why are women given one portion and the men given uh, two portions? So I had a very hard time in class when I was explaining this to the women seated there because they were saying that it's very biased towards men and it's discriminatory upon the women to give uh, such. It is not equal. Equal. So one thing why this ha this slogan has come up? Why? this argument has come up in the recent past rather than the before times is because there is a rise in gender equality. There is a rise in women empowerment. In the name of women empowerment, gender equality, they come up asking for equal rights. They say the women are much deserving as the men. Today morning when I was preparing this uh, document, I read a nice quote. It said that women are not created to do what man can do. Women are not created to do what man can do, but rather they are created to do what man can't do. Women are not created to do man, man, what man can do, but rather they are created to do what man can't do. So there are some things which man can do, but now the women want to do the same thing what the man can do. But in the real essence, what they should do is what the man can't be doing. So there was yeah, there was another one famous English writer, he had written, the main reason for the rise of gender equality and woman empowerment is that the objective of life has become whether position or wealth or fame, which will give them fame, then they will ask for gender equality. Because whatever man does, the work of a man, the capability of a man, it, it's either it brings him a high position or it brings him uh, uh, some wealth, or it brings him some fame. But it rather should not, the objective should not be 
position, wealth or fame, when the objective is happiness and satisfaction in life, then this gender equality debate will never come. When the objective of life is uh, satisfaction and happiness, the gender equality debate will never rise. But when the objective of life is wealth, position and fame, there is room for the debate of gender equality, woman empowerment to come forth in the uh, community. Since it's about gender equality, I just mentioned some facts and <coughs> I read somewhere that someone arguing about gender equality, he nicely says, he says that in the, within the next future, we can see how much gender, women empowerment has failed. Then someone asked him why. He said, you will not have, you will not, will not have proud children who will say that my, my mom was a feminist. He says, you will not have proud children who will say my mom was a feminist. He says, if you are a feminist, you have lost your next generation. You can't grow your next generation. So if, if there is an absence in the, in children who say that my mom was a feminist proudly, then it means the slogan of gender equality, woman empowerment has failed in a big way. So that is something about gender equality. So this why women are given less than men also is a debate brought forward due to the feminist thoughts and the feminist, uh, this thing, uh, the gender equality coming up in a rapid pace. Okay. The general law, if we take by its appearance, we understand that, okay, if someone reads the general law, he thinks, okay, it's giving the men and the women equal rights. It's separating in a just way, an equitable way. But what they don't understand is that giving equally to the men and the women, it creates, it affects the social and economical stability of the society. I will explain to you in the next, uh, how, as to how it affects in the next slide. And further, the constitution of the Sri Lanka in article 14 or 15, it says that there should be preference given to protect the family unit more than any unit in the country. The constitution clearly says that the family unit should be given preference to prot uh, in protection because that is one of the major units from where the society grows. So it not only affects the society, but it affects the family's unit also. Why? Because when the woman is normally, when the wife is richer than the men, there comes upon debates. There comes up, I, uh, since I was studying family law, I did, I asked the Khaldi of Kalambu as, so Khaldi of <coughs> one of the districts, not Kalambu. And he said, within the recent past, when my dad said this, within the recent past, that he has signed so many uh, divorce certificates, which came from the woman's side more than the men's side, which comes from the woman's side more than the men's side. And he said that most of the reason is that women are teachers and men are drivers. Women are teachers and men are drivers. So women have a more education, higher education, educational qualification than the men and women are, men are earning less than the men. So the women, they say that they don't deserve what they get from this man and they go for divorce. So he says most of them are fasakh. On the grounds of fasakh, they have come for divorce and it's mostly from the women's side. So that affects the family unit in a major way. So the Islamic jurists, the Fuqaha, they have given a clear uh, elaboration as to how this works, why the men are given more than the women, and I have put forward in the in a table. Okay, financial burden. In in the Islamic teachings, there is no financial burden in the upon the women. There is zero percent financial burden. The women has not got any responsibility to spend upon the child, the father, the husband, or the mother or siblings, anyone. But rather, if it's a man, he has to spend upon his father in some circumstances, upon the child, upon the wife, parents, siblings in some circumstances. But the women, she will all, always be looked after. Before her marriage, it will be her father who will be looking after. After her marriage, if it's, it's a husband, in the absence of both of them, the son, 
if the son also is not there, the sibling will look after her. So the women are always look after, looked after in times of, in uh, terms of financial burden. They are given their uh, ex expenses uh, in, of daily life. They are given shelter. They, they should be provided shelter. They should be provided food. Clothes should be provided to them. But the man, he has to earn it for himself. The man has to earn it for himself. So all the financial burden and the acquiring expenses are upon the man. So here the women get a, get a plus, plus, and the wealth decreases from the man. For example, he's given 66% and 33%. So this goes up and this comes down. Maybe 40% here now and maybe towards 50% here. And then if this person is going to get married, he has to give mahar. But she, even though there is some customary practices in the Islamic religious teachings, there is no such practices where the women should give anything to the uh, man. But there are some customary practices even in the, Islam, in the Sri Lankan legal system where I mentioned the Muslim Interstate Succession Ordinance, it says that the women should, sorry, Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, it says that the women should give men something known as Kai Kuli. So when I, normally for Mahar and all, the Arabic term is mentioned in English. So when I read that uh, in the class, I was like, what is Kai Kuli in Arabic? Yeah, I, I was like, what is Kai Kuli in Arabic? Then one of my Tamil friend, he's from Eastern province and he said, Kaikuli is not in Arabic, it's in Tamil. So it's clearly mentioned that a woman should give Kaikuli for men, but still it's a customary practice and it's not a religious practice. So Mahar goes down again, but the women gets a plus. When she gets married, she gets Mahar, but the men, she gives Mahar and it further decreases his wealth and financial support to the children. For example, who should look out the children? The school fee, the uh, shelter, food, clothes of the children, everything should be looked after by the men and the women don't have any financial burden with regards to the children, uh, uh, with regards to the children when she is looking after children, but she has to only nurture the children and all the financial support will be provided by the husband. So this goes to a minus and this goes to a plus. By the time all these features, this might have come to 66% and this might have come to 33% by way of example. Okay. How does it affect the, how does it affect the uh, social stability, economics? First I'll come to economics. If anyone has studied economics, you'll understand that when, or business, you'll understand that when wealth is stuck in one place, that is not good for the society. When wealth is stuck in one place, it is not good to society. The nature of the wealth is it should be rotating. It should be rotating so that everyone gets a fair chance to live. Everyone gets a fair chance to earn. But if wealth is stuck in one place, then it is not good to the economical stability of the country or, or of that place or of the family unit. For example, I have 100,000 and in my, in my uh, place, there is five people. So what I do is, I take 75,000 and I put it in my safe. And the 25,000 I start buying my stuff. So these five people, they don't have anything. They have only stock. So I go buy stuff for 25,000. And this 25,000 keeps rotating among those people. He buys from that and he buys from this, they take exchange, all these things. But that 75,000 will be stuck and I shall remain rich because I have the 75,000. But what's rotating here is only 25,000. What's rotating here will only be 25,000. And if there is more stock than the wealth, then there'll be crisis. So that's what the economical stability does not, uh, will not be supported by giving more to the women because women are not given financial burden. They no need to earn in the Islamic system. So when they know it earn, when they're given more wealth, when they're given mahar, when they're given all the expenses, what they're going to do, they're not going to invest it. They're going to keep it there and just hold it. So that is not going to help the stability of the economy. So, yes, will be stocked under her position and it will be not be rotating. So that is why the economical stability will be, uh, will be disrupted by giving more to the wealth because when you give and give and give, everything goes to learn. <clears throat> since the past year, since I, from the time I graduated from Madrasa and um, the religious seminary, I enrolled in the law, uh, law 
legal studies field and I have learned a lot regarding how comprehensive the Islamic legal system is rather than the contemporary legal system. So today we have a problem where most of the lawyers say that the ulamas they don't understand anything and the ulamas they blame the lawyers and they say that they don't understand anything what we say. So when I went to the legal school and what I understood is both of them are correct in one way. The problem is they don't know their language and these people don't know their language. So, but when I went and studied there and I, I got experience uh, as to how this works, there are so many similarities between the two systems. But there are some differences in which the Islamic legal system goes above the contemporary legal system, like how the man-made laws doesn't work, the reasons what I said there before, because when man makes law, he will exclude himself from liability in the first place. So all those reasons uh, came into contention. And um, if you all want to understand more about the Islamic legal system, there is one nice book written by uh, one of the famous lawyers in Sri Lanka. His name, he passed away in the recent past. His name is C.J. Veeramantri. Most of you all might know he has written the Islamic jurisprudence in, in, in an international perspective. It's a 200 page book. It's there in my bag downstairs. I forgot to uh, read. It's a nice book. Mashallah, he has written it comprehensively to the modern times. Like whatever the Fukaha mentioned in their book, he has matched it with the modern law and he has mentioned it clearly, very nicely in a comprehensive way. It, I have it with me in English, but I hope it's there in um, Singhala and Tamil also. It's a very nice book. Uh, he to mention was, uh, was the second in command. That means there is chief justice and the second in command vice president of the International Court of Justice not the Sri Lankan courts, the International Court of Justice. He was of such a rank and he's a person who is given the highest civilian award in Sri Lanka. So there is uh, all this Desha Bandhu and all those and there is something called Sri Lak Bhimanaya, I think. So he is given that highest civilian award in Sri Lanka. He was such uh, a kind of a jurist and he has so many writings. One of his writings is this, an Isl the Islamic jurisprudence in an Islamic perspective. It's a very nice book. He mentions clearly as to how the Islamic legal system uh, supersedes the contemporary legal system in some ways. And he mentions all the important things. And one important thing that he mentioned is, he mentioned an example of, a legal, of the Islamic legal system and he says, the Islamic legal system is such that how much belief, how much uh, belief you get, how much Iman you're, you are growing, you can see the uh, laws, you can see the regulations, you can see the beliefs in a more wider aspect. And he gives an example. He says that if you see the country from the, the your place from the first floor, you can see a bit. If you go to the second floor, you can see a little bit more. But if you go to the top of Lotus Tower, you can see the whole Colombo. So he says like that, the more you increase in your belief, your spiritual perspective, you can see more of the Quran. You can understand more of the Quran. So that's a nice example he gives from a perspective of a non-Muslim. So that's very nice to hear when he says, as a non-Muslim, that he, when he says such stuff, it's very nice, it's very, it's very good because that book helped me a, very, a lot to convince my teachers and my colleagues because he was not a Muslim. So when a Muslim says that Islam law is more comprehensive, they say, okay, he's a Muslim, so he's saying it. But when a non-Muslim says it's not like that, when not Muslim say it, it, adds, it adds value. It says, okay, he's, they say, okay, he's from our kind and he's saying this, then there should be something. So that book will help me a lot. It will be of much benefit if you all can read and understand how much the comprehensivity of the Islamic law is. Mashallah. Jazakallah for coming once again. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alam.